please remain standing if you're able to for the reading of the Word of God this morning. I can sense that the Spirit of the Lord is in this place this morning. I want to begin this message by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, the Word of God through Apostle Paul. It says, I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do but if you cannot control if they cannot control themselves they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion to the married I give this command not I but the Lord a wife must not separate from her husband but if she does she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and a husband must not divorce his wife before we dive into the Word of God and try to understand this passage, let us pray together and ask God to open our hearts for His Word. Let's pray together. Father, we praise Your holy name in this place. We praise You that Your Spirit is alive and is right here, right now, communicating with us with Your Word. And Jesus, we come before Your holy presence today. What a joy it is to come and sing that You are good. What a joy it is to come and say that our God is so good that in His goodness, He can even oversee our sins and forgive us from all unrighteousness. God, we praise You that we have the privilege to come here to hear Your Word, which is alive and active like a double-edged sword, penetrating and cutting through the, the iniquities and the shames that are deep in there. So today, Father, we give You permission to come and move in our hearts. Let Your Spirit to come and encourage and build up to prepare your church to be what you want it to be. We are here to hear from you, Jesus. Speak to us. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody today? Good. Hey, guys, I'm so thankful that you are here today as we continue in our series called The Fine Church. Today we're going to talk about what marriage really looks like in the church, what God really intends for the marriage. But before we get started, i got to tell you a few things. Some of you who are sitting here, you're not married. You're single, you're widowed, and you may think to yourself, but this message does not apply to me. If that is the case, I want you to understand that the scripture clearly says that the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. And as the bride of Jesus Christ, every word that we're going to read still applies to you. So you get to apply these principles into your own marriage in, with Jesus, into your own relationship with Jesus if you are not married or if you are widowed. So you will still get something out of it. Some of you who are sitting here are going to be really mad at me today and perhaps are going to hate me today. And the thing is... What I'm going to preach to you is not going to be an easy thing for a lot of us. Meaning, I am not sharing my own opinions. If I do share my own opinions, you have the right to get angry with me and upset with me. But I'm going to share the Word of God and the commands of God with you. So I'm asking you to have open minds and hearts for the Spirit of God to move inside of you. The second, the third thing, the last thing I want to mention is that some of you are going to hear this message today and you're going to feel guilty inside. You're going to feel perhaps even judged by the church. And you're going to think to yourself, well, these, these things are too hard of a thing for us to consider. Here's what I need you to understand. What is past is the past. What is yet to come is what is important. So your past is only a resource for you to be able to use, to be able to build your current present time so that your future would be remaining in God. And I need you to understand and apply that. There is no reason for guilt. There is no reason for condemnation by Christ right now because His blood has washed you clean if you believe in Jesus Christ. And I need you to understand that before we get into this message. Are you guys ready for the Word of God today? You know, I, um, my wife and I celebrated our 13th anniversary just last month. I know it's not long compared to some of you who have been married for a century. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just messing with you. But we just celebrated our, our 13th anniversary, and I have been really thinking a lot about what is love within the marriage? What does it really look like? What does it really imply? Why is it that people come together in a marital relationship and, and, and have such deep connection with each other? What causes all of that? And I remember, I remember the first day I met my wife when, she, when um, I laid my eyes on her. 
I was living as a refugee in Turkey, and we didn't have anything as a family. We, we had nothing. We were refugees. We were poor. But I was going to underground seminary. I was newer, kind of newer in my faith. I was going to underground seminary. And for those of you who have no idea what underground seminary means, we were living in Istanbul, a Muslim country. It was illegal for us to have any religious activity based on Christianity. So it was underground, hidden, because it was dangerous. And I was going through this seminary. I was learning about Apostle Paul. I was learning about the book of Acts. And we were going through the Word of God and reading thick theological books and I was just going through what Apostle Paul was talking about about all sort of different things that he did in his life and then I came across Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 where Paul says for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain and I remember I thought to myself I want to make this verse my life verse I want it to be a verse that I live by and I want it to be a verse that that I can I can grow with and I, I want to say for to me to live is Christ to die is gain that's what I want to say so I said, I want to serve Jesus Christ, and I began to serve, because we were refugees, I began to serve with the refugee ministry that our church had, and hundreds of people from hundreds of different nations would come to get help, and you know what, it was easy, I had nothing to give to God, no resources, no funds, no financials, but I had myself to give. So I gave myself to God, I said, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, until one day a young girl in her 20s, early 20s, came to where I was working to work with refugees and fresh off the plane, not the boat, fresh off the plane, she entered into my world in a sense and I began to see and observe her for weeks. Here I was saying for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But the only thing I had to give was myself. That's all I had. And here comes a girl from United States, from Tucson, and she has left aside every luxury of this world. She has left aside everything that she has. And she has come to say the same thing. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But she has given everything up. And I soon became really fascinated by her. I, I began to, and some of you are thinking, of course you did. You were a young man and she was a young girl. And biologically these kind of things happen. Hormones take place. And I, I understand you will think that. But oftentimes our filthy minds, the only thing they think of is sexuality. It wasn't really the sexual thing that attracted me to her. And I've got to be honest with you. I was attracted to the Jesus Christ, the living God that was moving inside of her heart. And I was observing her moves and, and the way she was serving Jesus. So for two years, I pursued her until she finally gave up and fell in love with me too <laughs> but I, I tell you all this and I, some of you may think now I'm, I'm being arrogant and boasting I tell you all this because 13 years later she's the only woman I've ever kissed the only woman I've ever been with sexually and I have no desire to be with anybody else because she's enough and the reason I tell you this is because if a man like me is able to overcome the sexual cravings and things like that, anybody can. If you hold on to Jesus, if you hold on to him, you can live lives that are sexually pure. And I want you to understand that. I know some of you come from backgrounds. Again, don't, don't allow the past to damage the present. Right now, it is about now. What can we do for the future? So before we can really dive into the Word of God, i got to go back to last week's message for a, for a second. Our elder Rick Ford did an amazing job talking about immorality within the church. And I want to just touch on one single verse, uh, a portion of the verse, chapter 6, verse 18. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from sexual immorality. And, and before we kind of dive into chapter 7, by the way, if you have your Bibles, would you please open up to chapter 7? Okay, that's where we're going to be. First Corinthians chapter 7. If you do not have a Bible, raise your hands. Let our ushers bring you one, okay? Just keep them off. Let our ushers see you. Now, it is important, it is important for you to have a Bible today because, and hopefully you'll find out soon, but Paul comes and says, flee from sexual immorality. And I want to give you a window towards the Greek language for one second. The word used in the Greek language for sexual immorality is the word, it's in your note, pornian. Okay, the word pornian. Now, in our culture today, when I say sexual immorality, most of us have a simple understanding of what it really means. Okay, for us, I just don't do anything that people think is wrong sexually. 
But the culture has shifted so much that people consider a lot of things that are sexually immoral as not being immoral. But when Paul wrote this word, when Paul said flee from pornian, the word constituted certain definitions within it that were given that anybody who read it understood what it means. For example, a few examples of it. And again, this is not my own opinion, okay? For example, one example is fornication, okay? Was sexual immorality. Adultery was sexual immorality, Bestiality, sex with animals, was sexual immorality. Homosexuality was sexual immorality. These, this word constituted all these things within it. Now, before I go any further, I wonder, though, since there was no pornography at the time, I wonder if pornography would be considered sexual immorality. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, we drive the word pornography from the root of the Greek language, pornian. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is any sexual misconduct outside of a marriage between a man and a woman was considered pornian, sexual immorality. And apparently at this time, when Paul is writing this letter, they had sent, the Corinthian church had sent a letter to, to, the, to Paul indicating that there was issues going on within the church, sexual immorality. So Paul writes to respond to that. And by the way, do you guys want to know how you can clear the whole church really quickly? Let me show you. Let me show you. Verse 1, okay? Especially the men here are going to be really upset. Verse 1 says, for, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. There, I just lost all the men. <laughs> okay, of course, this is taken out of context in the, in the matters that we are kind of really looking at. It's good for a man to not have sexual relationship with a woman, but since sexual immorality, since pornian is occur- occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband in the same way the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to, her, to his wife. Listen to this. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift and another that gift. In other words, Paul comes and says, listen, in a marital relationship, a husband and wife need to be in unity with each other. In fact, I have something in your notes for you. As I mentioned earlier today, the church is, if the church is the bride of Christ, now whether you are married or unmarried, I want you to write this down, okay? If the church is the bride of Christ, then there are, in his family, there are no problems that cannot be solved with proper communication. If the church is truly the bride of Christ, and if we belong to Jesus, then in the family of Jesus Christ, there are no problems, absolutely no problems that cannot be solved with proper communication. Now, I have lived in four different countries. I have li- traveled to some of the other countries. I have, um, I have observed people. I've always loved observing other people and their behaviors. I've worked with people for, with over 100 different nations and backgrounds and cultures, and I have never seen a problem that has not been solved when the people came together to communicate with each other. That's why Paul comes and says, unless you have mutual consent, come together and talk about the problem. Did you know wars happen because the politicians lack to communicate with each other and then they send the soldiers to be the pawns? So Paul comes and says, listen, um, unless, unless you mutually communicate with each other, you can't, you can't deprive each other. And I know as I say, deprive some of you. Our mind immediately goes to sexuality. Does anybody like illustrations here? <laughs> Except me, uh-huh. anybody? <laughs> I'm going to do an illustration for you guys, okay? <laughs> oh boy, huh? Now, in a marital relationship... The cup is going to represent a covenant. Now, whether you are single, widowed, you're still in a covenant with God. Okay? You're still in a covenant with God. When you are married, you're also in a covenant of marriage. So in a marital relationship, when you enter into a covenant, one pours themselves in, and then the other does the same thing. Now, the interesting thing about the oil and the water in our analogy is that 
they are really hard to mix. And a few weeks ago, we talked about how my wife and I are, are one according to the Scripture, but we are two different entities still under one covenant, which is Jesus Christ right now. But within a marital relationship, see, even though two entities are different, an entanglement is necessary, meaning some of you, again, with your dirty minds, immediately you think sex. But entanglement is way more than that. It's, it's psychological, it's emotional. In other words, you need to have communication, you need to have sexual relationships, you need to have all sorts of different ways of communication with each other that allows the entanglement to take place. But when the entanglement is done, then the unity causes the two entities to still be separate within under the same covenant. But they need to have that entanglement. The same thing is true about your relationship with God. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Okay. So then Paul comes and says, says, verse 5, he says, Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral, all those who commit pornean, sexual immorality. In other words, Paul comes and says, listen, you know, the problem is that when you do not communicate within a marriage properly and try to solve the issues properly without having to deal with it the way God really wants you to do, what you do is you open the floodgates of hell to your marriage. And you allow Satan to enter in such a way to destroy and bring destruction into that marriage. In other words, what you do is you tell Satan, come on in, welcome, you're welcome. You're welcome in my marriage. By the way, this is off topic, but off topic but I hear this often people come to me and say hey uh, my wife and I or my my husband and I we don't we don't argue I've been married for 13 years and if I could tell you with honesty yes your pastor and his wife argue and there's one out of three reasons as to why people often don't argue in their marriage one they don't really have a marriage they're housemates Two, one is abusive, one spouse is abusive, and wins the argument, perhaps doesn't even let it to become an argument. And three, they are a scam. They act as though they don't argue, but they're arguing at home all the time, but when they're on social media, they say, hashtag perfect marriage. <laughs> but Paul comes and says, listen, unless you have con con uh, mutual consent, unless you have communicated with each other, do not deprive each other. And that depravity does not mean just, just sexuality. It means everything. Unless you have given each other immoral um, morality, unless you have given each other your psychological um, attention, you have given each other the love that you desire, deserve for each other, unless you have done all that kind of stuff, you are allowing Satan to enter. Unless you communicate, you allow Satan. Because for most people, they say, you know what? My wife is not doing what I want. My husband is not doing what I want. It's just a little bit of a picture I'm watching or looking at. You see, at first glance, it's not that bad. It's just a little thing. But man, you mix that, allow the entanglement to take place. Soon, the relationship that you were in becomes diluted. It's just one picture. It was just a look with the secretary. It was just that. And before you know it, you have opened the floodgates of hell into your relationship. <coughs> I, mean, I know some, some husbands and wives, and one of the ways we fall into that temptation is... Let me get some napkins here. Thank you. One of the ways we fall into that temptation is... Hus thank you. Husbands and wives often come and I hear this all the time too maybe you've heard that maybe you've said these words they come and say you know my my wife doesn't love me the way she did when we first got married or we were dating my my husband doesn't buy me flowers the way he did before when we were dating or we were doing things and he's changed he has changed she has changed and I gotta tell you this I have been married to my wife for 13 years and my love for her has, has only increased over the years more so that I can even comprehend 
but the form and the expression of my love has changed for her. Meaning even God does not show his love to you in the same way that he did before. In the scripture it says, for God, some of you have memorized John 3.16, okay? For God so, what was the word? For God so the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life and then he goes on and says because he didn't come to condemn the world but to save it but then he says he loved the world so much that he gave his son to die on the cross that was the expression of his love for you okay but then also Romans it's not on the screen but in Romans it says for God demonstrates his own love for us in this that while we were still sinners Christ died for us so how did God show his love for you by giving his son to die on the cross for you but then Jesus said when I'm gone, I will send the advocate. See, the form of love changed. It says, it says in 1 John chapter 4, 13, it says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. He doesn't need to have Jesus crucified every day for you to know to lo- you, you love him or he loves you. But instead, he has sent you his spirit. Now, the form of love has changed. And some of you are caught in the fact that, hey, in the past, my husband did that, my wife did that. You are opening the floodgates of hell. Because you're so focused on the past. But you're not allowing the present time to work in your marriage, in your life. And again, Paul comes and says, do not deprive each other. Do not deprive each other. Now, are you guys still with me this morning? Okay, good. Just want to make sure you're awake. Verse 8 says, Now to the unmarried and to the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. In other words, what he comes and says is this. If you are unmarried, if you are a widow, you are still in a covenant with God. And you need to still stay away from sexual immorality. If you are dating here today, if you are unmarried and you are dating here today, I want to tell you something and most people will not tell you. If you are dating for the sake of fun, quit it. But if you're dating and you're serious about getting married, then stay honest to each other. If you have a a boyfriend or a girlfriend that is seeking to have sexual relationship with you, it's because they are selfish and they don't want you to be pure in God. Maybe you need to look elsewhere. And I know most people will not tell you that, but here's what I want you to understand. God says, if you cannot keep yourself pure, if you're dying with passion, then then try to find somebody to get married. Otherwise, you know what you're going to do? You're going to welcome immorality into your relationship with God. And that corruption, that corruption is going to destroy everything. And then he says, verse 10 says, To the married I give this command, not I, but this is the Lord's command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not, div- not, must not divorce his wife. In other words, what Paul comes and says is this, You must not separate and try to communicate and work things out. Is it possible to separate these two from each other? I think it is. Watch this. This is the act of divorce. Let's just say I separate. But no matter how hard I try, a portion of that is still going to be in this one. And this is, this is why for some of you who have lived uh, multiple marriages, you have brought a portion of that relationship to your new relationship. For those of you who have committed, that's why the scripture says do, says, do not sleep with the prostitute because your flesh becomes one with that. That's why the scripture says, do not sleep with other people. That's, that's your flesh becomes one. You bring that corruption into the new relationship. Now, I know this sounds horrible as we go through it, as we talk about it right now, but, but hold on, okay? And the problem is, though, as you separate, then you mix yourself with somebody else and that person's corruption enters in that relationship and now you have a generation to come that is filled with mess, chaos and disorder and you say how am I supposed to deal with all of this in fact I want you to write this down before I tell you the answer of that okay if the church is the bride of Christ compromised members compromised members of the household will inevitably be dysfunctional members of his church and jeopardize the mission of the church. When you allow sexual immorality in the church, you jeopardize the mission of the church. But the thing is, some of you come from this. Some of you come from a background that was horrendous. Any sexual immorality, any act was done. 
And now you're caught in a place, say, well, I have brought all of that into my new relationship. And what I want to tell you is that you may have been what you may have been, but today is a day of renewal. And today the promise stands that those who were filled with iniquities, shame, and sinfulness, today the Spirit of God can wash you clean. Today the Spirit of God could give you a renewed perception about your marriage. And I know as I go through some of this, some of you are thinking, well, are you telling me sexual immorality is, is all these different things that I've committed, I've been committing? I mean, it's too much. It's too much of a burden for me to go through all this. I mean, I have cravings. I'm a young man. I'm a young woman. I'm an old man. I'm an old, old woman. I have these cravings inside of me, and I need to satisfy these cravings. What am I supposed to do with them? It's too much of a burden for me to stay pure in that. I want you to think how much of a burden it was for God. To send his only begotten son to die on the cross for you so that you would have life of eternal with him some of you may think to yourself well this is too judgmental if I've gone through all this no this is not a message of judgment in a message of correction today the Spirit of God is moving amongst all of you and he's saying what you have lived in doesn't matter but what you're gonna do with it today matters Spirit of God is calling you by name, saying it doesn't matter where you have been, what you have done, I will forgive you. But the thing I want you to think about also is this. As the bride of Christ, you have been called to be a reflection of a relationship that you have with God. And I want you to think, how is it that God has put people in your path and because of your lack of communication with your partner, with your, with your wife, with your husband, you cause other people to fall away from God rather than falling in love with Him. And that is a burden that you have to bear too. Because God has put you together with whoever you are with right now so that your life would shine that your life would represent what it looks like to be married to Christ. What it looks like to have a mirror reflection of a relationship that God has with His loved ones. So wherever you have been, whatever you have done, today is a day of a clean slate. I want to ask the prayer team members to surround the room. If they are here, I want to ask them to come with their spouses if their spouses are willing. I'm going to ask my wife to join me up here. If you're married today and your spouse is with you, I want you to hold on to their hand, would you? And don't let go, just hold on. If you're, your spouse is not here, if you're single or widowed, I want you to hold on to a Bible, to the Word of God, as a symbol of saying, I hold on to Christ. When we finish praying, I want to encourage you to come forward. Go pray with one of our prayer team members. If you're comfortable praying on your own as a couple, I want you to come perhaps kneel at His presence, saying, God, together we come to you, kneeling before the presence of the mighty God. Because from this point forward, our marriage is not about the past. but It's about the future. So if you wouldn't mind standing up right now, don't let go of your spouse's hands or this Bible that you are holding. I want us to read as a prayer of declaration Psalm 51 verses 10 through 12. If you would read it with us and declare this for your marriage. Let's read together. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Father, as we come before your presence as your people, as your bride, 
I worship you this morning with my brothers and sisters. I worship you this morning with your church. God, because I know that it doesn't matter what iniquity, what shame, what guilt we have buried in the depths of our hearts, that your spirit is already aware and is already active working within us to bring us a refreshing sense of knowledge, love, and renewal. And God, today I pray for those who are broken. I pray for those who have felt, felt the guilt and the shame that today your hand, your mighty arm would reach down and bless them and show them that your love is greater than anything they have ever experienced, that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in you will not perish but have eternal life because you did not come to condemn, but you came to give life. You came to give your spirit of renewal. So Jesus, we come before you. Move in every heart in this place. Touch every soul in this room. Whether single or married, they all belong to you. They're all your creation. But some of us have deviated from your path. And today you're calling us back. For those of us who are married, Lord Jesus, I pray that this week our marriage would reflect the glory of the living God who has sent His Son to die on the cross for us, that we would be an embodiment of what love really is supposed to look so everyone around us would see there is something amazing about this marriage. And for those of us who are single, God, I pray that our passions, our cravings would not cause us to fall into temptation, but we would stand strong in the Word of God that we would receive you with our passion being only for you. God, we cast out the powers of hell from our relationships. We command the authorities of Satan to leave us alone because in the name of Jesus, there is victory. In the name of Jesus, there is deliverance because there is no other name worthy of our praise and his name is Jesus Christ, so we praise you today. Be glorified in our lives. We bless you, Father. We bless you today and allow our lives to be a reflection of you. In your precious name I pray. Amen.